Hello, everyone. Welcome to Float Down the Coast. We're going to be starting in about another minute or two, so just sit tight. Thanks so much for joining us. Hello, hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to Float Down the Coast uh, with Sea Otter Savvy and several partnering organizations we've got here today. Um, I wanna welcome you and also remind everyone that it's Sea Otter Awareness Week. So this is uh, one of the many events going on uh, for Sea Otter Awareness Week and we'll be floating down the California coastline today. Um, I do want to make sure that if anybody has any questions whatsoever, to leave them either in the comment box below. If you've found this uh, YouTube page from a Facebook page, you're welcome to leave the comments there as well. Anywhere you can plug in a question, feel free to do so and we will make sure to get that answer for you. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and bring it to my friend, Heather Barrett from Sea Otter Savvy. Thank you so much, Robin. We are thrilled that everyone's able to join us today for Float Down the Coast with Sea Otters. My name is Heather Barrett, I'm with Sea Otter Savvy. And this event was made possible with our friends from California State Parks, Defenders of Wildlife, and many other partners. So thank you all. And thanks all to the biologists and interpreters that are here today. Um, today, you guys are gonna be visiting six different locations along the California coastline. Um, some of them are current um, Southern Sea Otter Range, some of them are historic. Um, and you're gonna learn more about this keystone species. Hopefully we're gonna see some wild sea otters today. And we're gonna learn why these locations are so important. So a little bit of background is that the Southern Sea Otter Range is around um, Año Nuevo all the way down to Gaviota. Um, and so some of our interpreters are gonna be talking about that. But I also wanna let you know that there's a new story map online and it allows you to virtually visit some of the best locations to view sea otters, as well as learn about these places that have um, play a really important role for sea otter history, research and conservation. So that link is gonna be added below the video um, in the description box once this video is complete. So I urge you guys to check it out and share with your friends. And without further ado, we're gonna start with Joe in Half Moon Bay. Take it away, Joe. Hey everyone, and welcome to beautiful Half Moon Bay. My name is Joe Tomlione. I'm a biologist with the US Geological Survey's Western Ecological Research Center. And our research team uh, studies sea otters and nearshore marine ecosystems. We also conduct the annual sea otter census in California. It's a range-wide census, and it's done with our partners at the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and Monterey Bay Aquarium and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So we're here in Half Moon Bay today to talk about what's going on with sea otters at the northern end of their range. Behind me, we have kind of a famous spot in Half Moon Bay, Pillar Point. And just off of Pillar Point is one of the most famous surf breaks in the world called Mavericks. This is a 60 foot wave when it's really going off and people come from around the world to surf this wave. So if you've been to Half Moon Bay before to watch the Mavericks competition or just for a nice meal on the coast, you're probably saying, Joe, I've never seen a sea otter in Half Moon Bay. And I'd say, you're probably right. And that's because 
we're actually 20 miles north of the official range boundary in the north for southern sea otters. So that range boundary occurs right around Pigeon Point. And if you've ever drove Highway 1 from Santa Cruz up to San Francisco, you would see a big lighthouse about halfway there. And that's Pigeon Point. You can't miss it. So that's the official northern range boundary for southern sea otters right now. <clears throat> However, we do get sea otters up here occasionally. We call these sighting, occasional sightings of sea otters in Half Moon Bay extralimital sightings. It's a sighting of a sea otter that's outside of the current established range. But it's not just Half Moon Bay. Otters will sometimes show up near San Francisco and on the North Coast, Mendocino, and up there too. It's not a super common occurrence, but it does happen and usually multiple times a year. Um, and these sightings or sometimes strandings are almost always single individual sea otters and they're almost always males. And the reason for that is males travel great distances compared to females. Females are what we refer to as highly site fidelic. That means they stay in a relatively small area. They like their same handful of kelp beds, same few miles of coastline, while males will sometimes make trips of hundreds of miles over many days. And so these males are traveling outside of the established range occasionally on sort of like exploratory jaunts, probably looking for new food resources or maybe just some new habitat to rest in. Um, so although we don't have otters here in Half Moon Bay today, at least an established population, we used to many years ago. If you go back in history, there are not only otters in Half Moon Bay, there are otters in San Francisco Bay, there are otters all up and down the North Coast, and they range from Baja, California, all the way up Western North America, across the Pacific Rim to Japan. And they, in these former uh, areas that they occupied, they utilized near shore marine habitats as they do today, but they also utilized bays and estuaries, and those were pretty critical habitats for sea otters back then as well. So. The name sea otter sort of makes you think they're only an ocean dwelling animal, but um, historically they lived in estuaries um, just as much as they did in the oceans today. And last year, in fact, there was a study that came out that estimated that San Francisco Bay could potentially support over 6,000 sea otters alone. And that's a pretty astounding number when you think about the fact that the entirety of the range in California today supports about 3,000 sea otters. So this study said that San Francisco Bay, given the habitat available in the bay, could potentially hold twice as many sea otters as we have today in California. That's pretty amazing. <clears throat> so you might be wondering, why aren't there otters in San Francisco Bay today? Why aren't there otters in Half Moon Bay today? Um, to answer that question, you have to go back a few hundred years and think about how otters stay warm in the ocean. They have these luxurious, fur coats, the thickest pelt of any animal in the world, in fact. So they were hunted for these luxurious fur coats and they were hunted to near extinction throughout most places on the West Coast of North America. And in California, they were thought to be gone when a population of a few dozen animals was discovered in Big Sur off the Bixby Bridge. This raft of otters formed the founder group for all the otters that we have today in California. So the numbers have grown from those few dozen animals, but the range has also expanded from Big Sur to the current established range today. And although the northern range limit is at Pigeon Point, we actually see the, north, the farthest north we see um, large rafts of otters and females with pups is right around Año Nuevo Island, which is about six miles south of Pigeon Point. And this is a really, uh, this is a really interesting spot. It's a great spot to go visit. Um, you can see otters there. They're famous for the elephant seal colony that's there. Make sure you bring your binoculars. The otters are kind of far away, but it's a really interesting point um, to see otters right at the northern um, edge of their range there. And you, you may also be wondering why do the females and the pups sort of stop around Año Nuevo and why haven't, hasn't the range really um, expanded past Pigeon Point? And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that, but um, range expansion can't occur with just a few, few, few males occasionally making um, journeys outside of the range. What you really need for range expansion to occur is to have females move outside of the range, establish themselves outside of the range, and start having pups outside of the range. So that just hasn't been happening in recent years anyways. And when you look at the population as a whole and you go back to central California and most of the center of the range, 
Um, those otter populations or subpopulations are kind of maxed out on the number of otters that they can support. The prey resources and the habitat available to them can only support so much. And so the number of otters that we have in a lot of these center of the range places are pretty established at what they're gonna be and they're not gonna grow a whole lot. So in order for population growth to start occurring in California at an appreciable level, range expansion really needs to start happening at the edges. Um, even though that uh, needs to happen for population to growth, for population growth to happen, it hasn't been happening. Um, the range has not expanded in the north or the south in more than a decade now. And there's a lot of questions about that. You may be wondering why that is. So are we. Um, we have some pretty good ideas about what's going on, um, but it's a complex question with a lot of potential answers. Uh, for starters, you all might know that sea otters really love kelp forest habitat and kelp forests grow in rocky reef areas. So the best habitat, the habitat that can support the highest density of otters occurs in these rocky reef kelp forest areas. And when you travel up the coast from Santa Cruz to San Francisco, there's really only a smattering of that habitat available. Most of the habitat up here is open water, open ocean, uh, sandy bottom type habitat. And while that habitat can support sea otters, it does so at much lower densities than kelp forests do. So that could be coming into play with a, a lack of growth at the northern end of the range. But another factor we really believe is impacting things is survival of sea otters up here. And the thing is, range-wide sea otters are getting um, hit pretty hard by shark bite. And it's no exception up here, actually it may be even greater up here, where at least half of the sea otters that wash up at the northern edge of the range are shark bitten sea otters. And so this is just something that sea otters have to contend with. Um, this is one of the great white shark hotspots in the world off the San Francisco coast up here. Um, and that's a, good, that's a good thing, you know, sharks are important to the ocean, but it's definitely become a little bit of a hurdle and an obstacle for sea otter range expansion to the north anyways. And so that's kind of my update from the northern edge of the range. And thanks for having me today. Thank you so much, Joe. That was excellent. And it's so interesting to hear all of that information from you with Half Moon Bay. So now we're going to be moving a little bit further south down to Elkhorn Slough, and we're going to be talking to Jenna. Hey, everybody. I am Jenna Bental. I am the director and senior scientist for Sea Otter Savvy. And I'm here in Elkhorn Slough, which is a wetlands estuary that connects Moss Landing, the town of Moss Landing in the harbor, with Monterey Bay. And Joe actually gave me a great intro because he talked about the potential for a, a wetlands area like the San Francisco Bay to support sea otters. And here in Elkhorn Slough was really where uh, we first started understanding how sea otters live in estuaries and ha how they can be an important habitat for them. Um, you'll notice Elkhorn Slough at the bottom of my screen. So a slough, even though it's spelled weird, it's pronounced oo, is a wetland, a marsh, a tidal area. And it connects uh, the, the, the in, uh, the land area to then the watershed to Monterey Bay. And it is really the first place where we started to understand how sea otters are so very much at home in an estuary. Historically, um, sea otters occupied estuaries and wetlands throughout their range. And we only know that from uh, historical records and archeological records. Elkhorn Slough has now provided a window into the potential benefits of sea otters uh, two, wet, two wetlands and estuaries. So I'm actually gonna flip uh, my camera around here so you can see what I'm looking at. There we go. So if you squint your eyes, you can actually see a little raft of sea otters. Um, they're right behind that uh, yellow and orange kayak that's paddling towards the left of the screen. So normally they would be pretty well anchored up here because of the eelgrass beds, but the tides are a bit high. So as the tide gets higher, 
the surface of the eelgrass beds become submerged. And so the sea otters don't have that canopy. It's very similar to what a kelp forest canopy provides. Kelp forest slightly less susceptible to changes in, in tide. So they're kind of waiting in place where they know that eelgrass bed is gonna be exposed. You might be able to kind of see a lighter patch of water um, underneath there is where the eelgrass bed is. And as the tide continues to go out, uh, that will become exposed and they'll kind of nestle in there. So when they're not anchored by that, they kind of get pulled around by the tides and pushed by the winds. And you'll see um, that they're also going to be surrounded by quite a few recreationists. So we have a lot of kayakers, um, stand-up paddle boards, hydro bikes, all kinds of people out enjoying the slough on the water. And they're kind of, these guys are kind of floating around right now because they're not really well anchored or protected by that, that eelgrass bed. So we do like to call this whole area right here. So by the way, this is called, uh, this specific location in Elkhorn Slough is known as Seal Bent. And it's called the bend because it's a great big pronounced elbow in the slough as it winds back towards the east. And seal bend because on the shores on either side you can find resting harbor seals hauled out. And we also have sea otters resting here and seabirds. So this is what we would refer to as a bedroom community. This is a place where animals come to get their rest, all kinds of animals. It is also a place where people like to come and see and experience these, these animals. So it's important if you're gonna take a paddle here, go on an adventure to Elkhorn Slough to know before you go, understand guidelines and how your behavior can impact the wildlife here and learn some tips. You can go to the seaottersavvy.org website to learn some tips and guidelines for paddling around sea otters. So we can kind of see um, the folks out here on the water. Right now they're being really good. We ask people to give five kayak lengths uh, of space between them and the sea otters. That's about 60 feet. And you can also see these paddlers are um, passing by parallel. I'm trying to get them. There we go. So these kayaks are doing a great job. They're a good 80 feet away from the raft behind them and they're passing by to the side. They're not pointing their boats directly at the sea otters. They're giving them lots of space. Uh, if you turn your kayak and your, the bow of your kayak right into the raft, they're a lot more frightened. It's a lot more threatening and aggressive. And so if you pass by without doing that, um, you, they're, you're much less likely to cause a disturbance. So one of the important things about understanding that this is a bedroom community, a resting area for wildlife, relates to one of the things that Joe mentioned earlier about areas in the center of the range in California being um, at or near carrying capacity. So there's as many otters here as the food resources can support. So the otters in Elkhorn Slough are now considered to be at or near carrying capacity and they are really right at the edge of their um, body condition. So they're just meeting their caloric needs every day. You guys have probably all heard otters have to eat a quarter of their body weight every day just to survive. If a mom has a pup with her, by the time that pup is older, she's gonna need twice as much. And we do have a lot of females with pups in Elkhorn Slough. So because they're right on that nutritional edge, right on that razor's edge, they need extra respect because they cannot afford to waste any energy paddling, swimming, diving away from encroaching humans. And this area can get pretty busy on a weekend, we can see, I don't know if you guys can all see, there's a whole bunch more kayaks on their way up here. Pan over here, we have a few more recreationists. These guys are all doing a good job so far. You might be able to see a lot of the resting birds on the far shore. So it's really important, especially with lots of people using the water to remember that everything you do matters and to give these animals lots of respect. And finally, I wanna make one more point about the estuary. Um, there's a really great talk 
from which you can learn a lot about how important estuaries are to sea otters, how sea otters um, impact estuary habitat, much of that research done right here in Elkhorn Slough, and how they might, how um, other wetlands in the state might look if sea otters were able to recolonize them. Um, that's Dr. Brent Hughes. He's speaking about um, the topic. His topic is, are sea otters ghosts? of estuaries past. So we'll talk a little bit about the history. And that's Friday night at 4 p.m. Um, that's with the Point Lobos um, Foundation. And you can see the links to all of those events on uh, the Defenders slash Sea Otter Awareness Week uh, website. So with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over. Awesome, thank you so much, Jenna. That is excellent to be able to see all of um, all the kayakers actually doing a very good job of being respectful. Um, I will say that, that that's actually Point Reyes National Seashore Association for Friday. Right, and, yes, um, sorry. <laughs> and we're just, if anyone has any questions as we go throughout, please remember you can always ask your questions in the comment. Um, and we are gonna now move down to Pacific Grove where we have Andy and Michelle. If you guys can introduce yourselves and tell us about your location. Open it. I think we just need to have your clip. Can you hear us? Oh, yes, we can. Yeah, I think we just need to flip your screen a little bit. Yeah, it's very odd that. Uh, there we that go. Yeah, that works. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, uh oh. We might have to go handheld. Um, so uh, I'm Andy Johnson. I'm a uh, California representative with Defenders of Wildlife. And um, I'm here with Michelle Stedler. Hey. There she is. Half a face. Half a face. We're, uh, we're at Point Pinos in Pacific Grove, California. California. We're about a, a mile or so from Monterey Bay Aquarium. and. Uh, we're just uh, out here on some very uncomfortable rocks, uh, trying to spot some sea otters. There are a couple out there, but obviously they're not not visible uh, on the phone. But um, uh, Michelle and I worked together for a long time at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And uh, so we're close colleagues and we uh, thought we'd come out here and tell you a bit about Pacific Grove and the otters around the Monterey Peninsula. This, uh, this area, we're sort of along the, the Monterey Coastal Recreational Trail. It runs from actually right up about where Jenna is in near Moss Landing, uh, all the way down the coast uh, to Monterey and out the Monterey Peninsula to uh, uh, almost to uh, Pebble Beach. So if you're familiar with the area, um, you know that uh, Monterey is kind of at the top of the peninsula, Pacific Grove and Pebble Beach kind of wrap around the backside and then Carmel's at the bottom of the peninsula. And uh, there's been a lot of Seattle research uh, in all these areas over an extended period of time. And Michelle is probably the person who's studied the sea otters of the peninsula more than anybody else in the world. So uh, she'll have some good information about some, maybe some research project animals going forward. Um, so uh, I was gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, just my experiences around uh, sea otters in this area. Um, I moved here about uh, 23 or 24 years ago uh, for the, my job at the aquarium. Uh, and I was managing the, the sea otter research and conservation program there. And it was really kind of a, an interesting program in that we were, um, uh, there wasn't a lot of research going on uh, and we were just kind of taking care of some stranded sea otters. And uh, the, the idea was how can we sort of build uh, a research program and connect ourselves in the broader research community. There wasn't a lot of research happening out in the, out in the wild either. And um, with, uh, with Michelle, we really developed a, uh, a great strategy, I think, to collaborate with state and federal agencies, um, with academic, academia, uh, with uh, um, various researchers who are just interested in sea otters, with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and really developed uh, this strong research alliance that uh, ended up studying sea otters throughout their entire range. Joe, Joe was up at the northern end. We'll talk to some folks down at the southern end in a few minutes. So uh, the idea was trying to uh, uh, trying to really understand what was going on with sea otters rather than just uh, you know kind of watch them out there, but really try and understand what's happening in the population. So it was a, a great opportunity and a, and a really great run for me to be part of all that for a little while. And um, I think the, uh, the extraordinary thing from my point of perspective was just the, uh, 
the sheer intensity of of effort that it requires. Um, we uh, I didn't get out and do a lot of the, the monitoring, but we had uh, staff and volunteers out for uh, basically seven days a week, uh, at least eight hours a day, um, reciting animals, uh, collecting data on them, and Michelle will talk more about that. It was really a, an, an amazing effort. Um, and then this occurred up and down the coast as well. Anytime we were setting sea otters uh, in different locations up and down the coast, that same intensity of effort, which is truly extraordinary to, uh, to uh, follow these sea otters, uh, watch their behavior and, and uh, really understand what's happening with them. And uh, again, Michelle will talk more about sort of the importance of, of doing that. And um, I think we're just, uh, we're here on a lovely day. Uh, hopefully the fog won't roll in, but it looks like it's pretty nice. And um, I'm gonna turn it to Michelle for just a few minutes here and uh, I'll come back to wrap things up, but uh, yeah, okay. I'll, uh, oh, I see, we've maybe, maybe fixed our, <laughs> our uh, phone holder here. There we go. Yep. And uh, they pass it on Michelle and she can do another bit of intro and, and we'll go from there. Yep. Hey everybody, hope you're having a good afternoon today. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm sitting out here, as Andy mentioned, we're out at Point Pinos. Uh, this is one of our study areas that I studied for over 30 years, probably about 35 years with, with the Monterey Bay Aquarium, USGS, Cal Fish and Wildlife, UC Santa Cruz and others. Um, most of the work that we did was done on otters that were tagged. So these are what sea otter flipper tags look like if you haven't seen them. We put the tags on the otters to identify individuals. We bring them, we first capture them in the wild, bring them into a veterinary area to do some surgery on them, give them radio instrumentation, actually record sex, age, all kinds of information that helps us study them over the long-term period. Then we return the otter back to the wild and we start observing them. We use high powered telescopes, you know, Questar spotting scopes they're called, and we observe the otters. With each place that we go to, we can look at otters. Like earlier today, there was a few otters floating by here, although there weren't any of them tagged. And we follow individuals and we collect a bunch of data. So first of all, we might collect just where the otter is, who they are, what they're doing, where they're resting, are they feeding? What other behaviors might they be doing, interacting with some other otters? Who are the other otters around that they're hanging out with? Sometimes we record that. And another important part of what we do is collect forage data. And the forage data is a very important indicator of how well a population in a certain area is doing. So a lot of the other studies up and down the coast would do all the same data collection as we've been doing here. And the otters, we would collect the dive time, a surface time, a prey item, what they're eating, how long it takes them to eat. Did they use a tool to open that prey? If they had a pup, would they share the prey item with the pup? Um, so those are several things that we like to talk about or collect data on. And several papers have been published based on all that information, comparing all the different areas, some areas that were resource limited, some areas that have plenty of resources and how the otters uh, did in different locations. One of my focuses was on mothers and pups, and that was kind of my favorite thing to do. And I enjoyed following mothers. So an example of one individual otter is a female that was born in 1993. And we were able to tag her for the first time in 1995, I think. And we were able to follow her for 10 years. And she had several pups. And the very last pup that she had, we named it uh, Blanca. And that was one of my favorite otters. Blanca is still here. She works, uh, she lives around Monterey, uh, Cannery Row area. And she has had, over her lifetime so far, she has had um, 10 pups. She's on her 11th pup now. Of the 10, only five survived, survived to weaning and the other five did not. So we're trying to understand with some of our research, what helps an otter survive or what makes it survive? Is it the diet? If they're a diet specialist, which we didn't talk about much yet, but during the forage data collection, we look at otters, we analyze the data and certain otters may specialize in eating crab, <laughs> crabs and clams while others might specialize in abalone or mussels or something else. So 
by doing that, we thought, okay, if we know all the otters' specialties, let's see if the food makes a difference on how successful these females are in weeding their pups. However, that was not the case. Um, food didn't matter, no matter what you ate. If you were a snail specialist, you were just as likely to be successful in the pup as if a female that ate a cancer crab, which is a much higher valued prey item. So what we found out in the end is that really what mattered was the female herself, sort of individual characteristics of the female otter and what she, um, what her makeup is, her body condition, other things like that. There's other females that I've studied for years, and it's kind of fun to know generations of otters that have been related to each other, especially matrilineally. The males tend to disappear, but the females will stay near to where they're born. And we have several cases of where females, we've known the mother, the grandmother, and the daughter, um, and all the pups that they've had. And that's been one of the most exciting parts of my career as a sea otter biologist. I mean, I wow. turn it over to Andy. That, oh, it's Andy, if, there, if there's any last few um, points you'd like to make before we head to the next location. I'm sorry, say that again? I was going to say, is there any oh, last points that you would like to make for your location? Yeah, well, I was just going to say um, that uh, now that I'm working with Defenders of Wildlife, we're focused on, uh, it's perfect that it's Sea Otter Awareness Week. We're, we're trying to bring awareness to issues with sea otters, their importance within nearshore ecosystems. Um, as, uh, Jenna mentioned, uh, again, Brent Hughes will talk some about that uh, on Friday night, or Friday afternoon. Um, some other talks during the week um, will discuss uh, the importance of sea otters and their habitats. And I think the, uh, uh, some of the take home messages for people who want to help sea otters, um, obviously donate money in various ways uh, to uh, uh, the California Sea Otter Fund for California taxpayers. But, um, but generally, uh, we just uh, want to follow those that advice that Jenna gave about keeping distance from sea otters and all wildlife. It's important, they need their space to, uh, to do their, go about their business. And we wanna make sure that we uh, watch what we, what we throw away. A lot of the uh, pathogens and pollutants and plastics that we dump on the land end up in the, in the ocean. And, uh, and sea otters are right there at that interface of the ocean and the, and the land. So, um, so take care with what you, uh, what you dispose of and uh, just keep, keep the otters in mind when you're, uh, thinking about pitching something out or dumping something out of storm drain. Absolutely. With that, I'll turn it back to Heather and, and uh, everybody have a good day. Yeah, thank you so much, Andy. That is so true. And we're actually going to some options for people and below in the description after of links that people can look at more to learn more and also how you guys can help. Um, and thank you so much, Michelle. I actually remember finding Blanca with you at one of my first fan sessions and she was included in my <laughs> sessions too so i'm so happy to hear she's still there so yep, thank you guys there. you guys are so lucky to hear from the experts and now we're going to be headed down to morro bay and chat with mariana hi everyone i'm so excited to be here to celebrate sea otter awareness week my name is mariana and i am a park interpreter specialist for california state parks so I work for this wonderful symbol on my hat and there's actually a Western goal right behind me. <laughs> I am currently at Morro Bay State Park. Morro Bay is actually, I'll just mention it's a wonderful day right now. Usually it's pretty foggy and gloomy and hard to see, but right now the sun is out and the sky is very blue. For those of you that don't know where Morro Bay is, it is located on California's beautiful central coast. I am about four hours south of San Francisco and four hours north of Los Angeles. So pretty exciting. And there are two main locations where you might see the Southern Sea Otter. The first location is right here where I'm standing. And I'm standing right in front of Morro Rock, which is a very important landmark for different people. And the second location is closer downtown, known as P Pier. With that being said, I want to show you some sea otters. So I'm going to go ahead and flip the camera. I will also mention I am in a public area, so that is why I'm wearing my mask to protect myself and to protect others. So I'm going to go ahead and flip this around to hopefully see some sea otters. 
Now earlier, right before this, there was some type of disturbance that I was unable to see and a lot of the sea otters flushed. That means they went underwater and swam away. I was unable to see what it was, but most of the raft, which is a group of sea otters, fled away from me. So it might be a little bit more difficult to see them. But there you have it. Those are some southern sea otters. And in these sheltered waters of Morro Bay, there are about 30 to 40 sea otters. Most of the sea otters here are females, and some of them even have pups. So let's just do a quick scan, and maybe we can even see a pup. And for that, a pup is just going to look like a little fluff ball on top of its mother. So let's go ahead. I see a few, but it might be difficult on the camera. Quick scan. Maybe the other way would be better. It's a little bit shaky. Uh, well, I can't see any from right here, but I'm going to go ahead and leave it in this area. So there is no particular season of when you might see a pup. And a pup relies on its mother, especially at birth, and they tend to stay with their mother for about six months. And pups have different kind of fur compared to their mother or to an adult sea otter. Their fur tends to be more dense and buoyant. So dense and buoyant that they can't even dive underwater. So the mother sea otter invests so much energy in raising their pups because not only do the mothers need to continue to use energy to support themselves, but they need extra energy in supporting their pup. So mother sea otters with pups are especially vulnerable here at Morro Bay because this is a busy harbor and there are a lot of recreational activities that take place here. Just like Jenna mentioned earlier, there are a lot of people that use this space, that share space with sea otters. You might be able to see kayakers, people paddle boarding, scuba diving, even surfing, surfing farther along the coast. So that's a lot of activities that happen here in Morro Bay. And disturbing them wastes energy that they need to nurse and take care for their pups. For example, if startled, a mother might grab a pup and dive, forcing the pup underwater. And this is a sign of distress. I actually witnessed that just a few moments ago Right before I went on, there was a huge flush. Again, I'm unsure of what the disturbance was, but a lot of the sea otters got scared. They dove underwater and they moved away. And there are a lot of disturbances that could happen, especially when sharing space with them. So before visiting, learn what you can do to help protect these threatened animals. And when sharing, or when you're, sorry, <laughs> what you could do to help protect these threatened animals and making sure that you are being respectful and mindful when respecting their space. And we like to say you wanna be about six to eight kayak lengths away from the sea otters. And to look even less threatening, you might want to be parallel to the sea otters. So instead of facing directly towards them, you want to be parallel. That is one way that we can help protect these amazing animals. And another way that we can lessen, lessen disturbance is by, if a sea otter is looking at you, you are probably too close to them. That's one way we can identify disturbance. So I'm gonna take another scan because I really wanted to show a mother and a pup. I think it's so exciting to have the opportunity to show it. I might, is that one right there? I think it might be. It looks like there's a little bit 
on the center of the screen. It could be also its paw. But we'll do one more scan. As you can see, there are quite a few of sea otters out today. They probably knew I was going to show show them to you. So they came out just for you. <laughs> Amazing, Mariana. Thank you so much for sharing with us a look at some wild sea otters. And you can see as she goes through how some of them are really rolling and grooming and some of them are resting. So it's amazing to see those behaviors um, on the screen. So thank you so much. Is there any last points you'd like to make? Oh, and we looks like we're about to get someone to come say hi to someone else. <laughs> um, any last points you'd like to make for your location at Morro Bay? No, I really just want to thank you for joining me at Morro Bay State Park and that I hope you enjoy the rest of your voyage down the coast. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mariana. And just a reminder to everyone, we actually fixed our comment box. Apparently it was closed, but now it's open. So if you do have burning questions, you can write them in there and then we'll make sure to get to them at the end. But now we are headed down to Avila Beach where we have Francesca and Mike. Awesome. Hello. Hi, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Avila Beach. My name is Francesca Mannheim. I am a state park interpreter working for the Oceano Dunes District with California State Parks. And so normally I'm just down the coast in Pismo Beach in the Oceano Dunes. But today I came up here to Avila Beach to bring you all the beautiful footage that you see out here behind me and to talk about this important topic. And today I'm joined by Mike Harris. I'm a senior environmental scientist with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I've been uh, working on sea otters for uh, a number of decades now, particularly in this, this area we're at today. Awesome. So yeah, we're excited to bring you guys here virtually. Um, Avila Beach has been identified on our story map, which hopefully you guys have all checked out. There's the link in the description for this event. It's a map of the central coast of California where sea otters um, are found. And right here in Avila Beach or Port San Luis behind me, we do have some otters, which we'll zoom in on a second. But this area has been identified as an otter hotspot due to the disturbances that happen in this area. So you might see some kayakers, stand up paddlers. We've got a lot of action here. Avila is known as a busy tourist destination. So some of you watching may have actually been to Avila Beach. Maybe if you've been here, you could type in, say where you're from and say if you actually saw an otter while you were here. Um, so interpreters and scientists like Mike and myself, we're working hard to kind of educate the public on the work that the scientists are doing so that we can help the Southern sea otters in this area and throughout the range um, so they can recover and expand. But what I wanna do is turn our camera around because just out here kind of on the horizon, you might notice the blue sky and the um, fog line that's creeping on in. But right before it's burned off, we do have some otters out here, a nice raft of them and I'm gonna switch it around for a second and we'll have you guys take a look here and continue our discussion with the view of the otters. So you might be noticing the yellow kayak and the green kayak. And from earlier on, hopefully you heard that we do recommend keeping a five kayak length away. Say they're doing all right. They are pointing their kayak kind of directly at the otters and we recommend going parallel to otters. Um, so we don't want to get too close to them. If they do look at you, we say you are too close. Um, you might be causing a disturbance, but we'll keep the camera view on here. Um, and I do, as we look at this, I want to get a chance to hear from Mike about the natural history of this area. So Mike, do you want to share with us a little bit about the history of the otters in this area and the population here? Sure. So the Fort San Luis, Avila Beach area, was uh, reoccupied by otters back in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, otters were slowly expanding their, their range down the coast uh, during that time. Here at Fort San Luis proper, uh, over the last few years, we have on average 20, 25 otters that uh, tend to raft or rest in this uh, kelp bed that's developed here in the last few years, uh, right out inside the, the boat moorings. So they're located in an area with a lot of human activity, kayakers, boaters, sailboats. Uh, this raft uh, utilizes the, the protected waters of, of the port. We forage in here, um, but they also move around quite a bit. Um, we'll have some of these animals that might extend down into the Avila Beach, Shell Beach area, and then go north. 
Uh, Potters have been in this area, like I said, through the, the early 80s. Um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, along with all the other collaborators that have been talking uh, this morning, have been monitoring the population very intensively. And as you've heard, we do surveys where we're counting otters. We've done tracking studies where we tag and monitor animals intensively. But one of the other programs that's been really important is uh, monitoring causes of mortality. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife initiated mortality studies on sea otters over 50 years ago, and we make a concerted effort to examine every otter that's reported as dead. We learn a lot about what are impacting sea otters in California. And as you've heard recently, uh, shark bite mortality is becoming a very uh, leading cause of of otter mortality throughout the range. In this specific area, Fort San Luis and Avila Beach, we're in one of the areas that has some of the highest rates of shark bite mortality. Um, it can range up towards the 60% of the animals that I might collect down here are shark bit. Um, the interesting area, and otters have slowly continued to expand their range from here down into Pismo Beach and farther south. Very cool. Yeah, and so I work down at Pismo and occasionally we do see otters, um, not on a regular basis. That's why we came here to Avila because, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but this raft is here most of the days. This is kind right. of their per permanent location. We do have otters offshore at Pismo Beach regularly. It's just that they tend to be far offshore. The water depths are shallow, far off, off the beach. So, and there's not good vantage points to actually see otters from land there. So it's quite challenging. This is one of the more close areas where you can be uh, relatively close and get good vantage points to watch otters from telescopes, binoculars, or even with the naked eye. Yeah, very cool. So yeah, just to give you guys some more perspective, if you're familiar with the port here, we've got the pier right over here behind us with a raft of sea lions and other marine mammals that are living here. And the Cal Poly Research Pier off in the distance. So if you do come to look for otters, um, we definitely always recommend that you bring binoculars um, to be prepared for watching any wildlife so you don't have to get close to disturb them. Um, same thing if you're interested in photography, we don't want you to get too close to take a photo of the otters. Make sure you use that telelens or a long zoom on your phone um, to help protect these resting otters. And why is it so important we leave them resting? Like why are the disturbances so so bad for them? Right. I think there's some of the folks were uh, mentioning already the cause disturbance causes animals to expend energy and females particularly females with pups are really kind of on the metabolic edge they're just barely making a living supporting themselves and their pups so if you cause that animal to wake up from a resting bout swim away it's expending energy that really should be utilizing for itself or or dumping into its pup so we want to avoid disruption. We need to really do everything we can to mitigate uh, sources of stressors on sea otters. You know, we talked about the high rates of mortality on, uh, related to shark bites. We know there's nothing we can do about the rate of shark bite mortality. This puts greater emphasis uh, on us mitigating sources of stress or mortality that we can and disturbance is certainly uh, high up there on the list of things that we can mitigate. Perfect, yeah, great point. So we definitely need all your viewers' help at home next time you come to the Central Coast to vacation, maybe you're here for some ecotourism whale watching, uh, make sure you do your part um, to help protect the species when you encounter them in the wild. So I think that kind of wraps up our point here. Awesome. Yeah, it's been too so much Francesca and Mike um it's thank you so much for giving those points and recommendations and sort of emphasizing that for that location so we are now headed to Gaviota where we have Parker hello everyone my name is Parker and I am coming to you all from Gaviota State Park I'm a park interpreter specialist and I work for the Cal California State Parks right here at Gaviota State Park and you can see it's a little foggy morning here we've got that marine layer coming in um, but we are located about 30 miles to the west of Santa Barbara down towards uh, Southern California and whenever I think of Gaviota or mention that Gaviota State Park is the southern boundary 
industry for sea otters along the coast in California, people are always surprised. But in fact, occasionally we do see and spot sea otters along the coast. Sea otters um, can be found right here in the Santa Barbara Channel, and they're actually expanding and making their way into here. And they've been doing so since the 1990s. The Santa Barbara Channel is a very uh, biologically rich and productive ecosystem which also provides some very important food sources for the sea otters as well, including the urchins and crabs. And some studies actually showed too that the sea otters in the area feed, tend to feed more on octopus. Pretty interesting, huh? But this expansion down into the Santa Barbara Channel is something that is really important for sea otters. Because as previously mentioned, when we look at the central range for sea otters, They've reached their carrying capacity, their limit for their food sources. So it is promising as they move south, as there will be a more abundance of food and resources in the Santa Barbara Channel. Now, um, the sea otters in the area, they tend to hang out towards the west of here, where we do have some large kelp forests, and they, they love those kelp canopies. Um, we tend to see those out towards Hollister and Point Conception towards the west of here. And I know that's kind of crazy when I say to the west, but we do have a southern facing uh, shoreline at Gaviota State Park. Now, even though that's really exciting and really cool that they're m moving into the Santa Barbara Channel, there are still a lot of different threats that influence their expansion. Now, some studies have showed that white shark mortality among sea otters is their number one threat. But there are also threats that are caused by humans, us. We have um, oil and natural gas drilling that occurs in the Santa Barbara Channel. And we have natural oil and natural gas seeps. Those pose a threat to the sea otters. And if there's a spill, that'll have a big impact on them as well. And we also have a lot of shipping lanes that go right through the Santa Barbara Channel. We see them all the time, every day. Lots of ships come through. Those also have an impact on them, as well as recreationists too, right? We are out recreating, as mentioned, right? We wanna keep at least five kayak lengths away from sea otter. I was talking to someone this morning, a surfer who went, um, down out on the Hollister surfing um, the other day, actually yesterday, and they spotted a couple sea otters. And I talked to them too about the distance and that it was sea otter awareness. And they made sure that they were about, they were on shore at the time that they spotted them, but they just watched them in the dense kelp canopies up there. So sea otters are, are very important species and it's their recolonization of the Santa Barbara Channel is something that is really important to help really bolster their populations for the future. So with that, I hope you enjoy checking out Gaviota State Park and learning about a little bit about the recolonization of the Santa Barbara Channel and our Gaviota Coast um, with the sea otters. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Parker, for rounding out our float down the coast there at Gaviota. I just want to say thank you to everyone who kind of took up our call when we decided that we wanted to do this. It's amazing that we have so many of the experts, biologists, interpreters, and we've basically gone, you know, a few hundred miles down the coast, which is pretty amazing, all in one lunchtime. Um, and it's, it's great to be able to hear the history, the conservation efforts, the research efforts from everyone about the specific locations. And you can see, even as we went down, you had different sort of weather, you had different areas, whether it was open coast versus estuaries or in the bay. And all of these habitats um, are important for the Southern sea otter. So a few things that I wanna remind everyone that is watching, we actually have over 130 viewers right now, which is excellent. So if you guys have questions, please do ask them now in the comment section. We're gonna have a little moment for questions with everyone up as a panel. Um, and as you're writing in those questions, I just wanted to remind everyone um, about, this is for Sea Otter Awareness Week. We have a lot of different events going on to remind everyone tomorrow night, Cal Academy is going to be having Andy, who you heard from, from uh, 
earlier on, he's going to be speaking with Lillian Carswell and Mo Flannery. Um, and that's going to be 7 to 8 p.m. tomorrow night. We then also have um, Brent Hughes will be speaking for Point Reyes National Seashore Association. Um, and that's going to be Friday at 4 p.m. And we have a slew of other events as well. And all of those can be found on the official um, Seattle Awareness Week event page on Defenders of Wildlife. And we're also going to be featuring on all of our social media. So if you follow Sea Otter Savvy through Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and I recommend that if you guys like these videos, you can subscribe now to our YouTube channel. These will be made um, available afterwards so you can go back and rewatch or share with others. And we're also going to be including the link below that will take you to the story map. So if you guys want to then visit virtually all the way up and down the California coastline, you can do that. And I'm also going to include for those that listen to a little bit about Joe's talk, um, and the sort of range ends is we have the We Were Here page. And so that's gonna give some more information about sea otter potential recolonization in the Northern area. Um, and there's a poll at the bottom. So feel free to go check that out and share your voice as well. But I just, again, thank you. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Robin, which can hopefully put us into panel view. And we're gonna hopefully have some questions to answer for everyone. That was amazing. I learned so much. Thank you so much everyone for coming out today and celebrating Sea Otter Awareness Week. Um, we do have a couple of questions, so I'm gonna go, uh, go ahead and ramble some of those off now. Um, our first question is, how do you know if you're disturbing sea otters or other wildlife? Excellent question. I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna have Jenna Bental speak on this one. She is our disturbance expert, so. <laughs> That's a really good question because we actually believe that most disturbance to sea otters occurs unintentionally because people aren't aware that they're even causing a disturbance or what disturbance might look like or things that they can do to avoid causing disturbance. So the, one of the things I think um, Mariana might have mentioned that we, we recommend people look for is an animal, an otter or any animal to be looking at you. So as you're walking around throughout your day, whether you're on a hike, whether you're paddling out on an estuary or in the ocean, pay attention to how the wildlife around you reacts. And you might start to notice more and more how they'll look at you. And that may not be such a big disturbance in the end, although we don't really understand the level of stress that that animal is feeling at that point. But what it does do is give you a warning sign that they have noticed you, you have entered their world. And if you get much closer, they might flush, they might expend more energy. So sea otters will definitely do this if you're paddling along, um, especially if you're, if you're, um, you have a resting raft or group of sea otters in your sights, you might see their heads start to raise and look at you. And this is a behavior, you don't have to be an animal behavior expert to recognize it. You can tell no matter how familiar you are with animal behavior when an animal is looking at you. And as soon as they're alert, you wanna make sure you stop, you don't get any closer and maybe slowly, quietly try to, to backtrack away until they settle down a little bit. And it's really, really important to notice, to pay attention to these kinds of behaviors in places um, where otters may not be as familiar with people as they are here in Elkhorn Slough or in Morro Bay, because you, you may need to give them more than five kayak lengths of space. So Avila is a good example. Those otters, even though they're, they uh, interact with lots of humans, they do tend to flush at a farther distance um, than they do in, in some of our other disturbance hotspots. But if you're paying attention, and you see the otters start to notice you, even when you're further away, then you know that you shouldn't be getting any closer and that they might dive. If, if they dive and they start swimming away from you, then you've already caused a disturbance and maybe you've learned something, you've figured out something about your behavior and, and otter behavior, but um, try to avoid doing that if you, if you possibly can. So I hope I answered that question. Excellent answer, Jenna, and thank you so much. Is this from Francesca or is this from Mariana? Francesca, I just, you were able to find an otter Look up at him. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we were hoping for is a little bit closer and now everyone can see that is, is that, Mike, is there a tags on that otter? It's really hard, to, it's a little, still a little bit blurry, but. Uh, it's a, uh, looks like an adult female. She's foraging in the shallows here, picking up a, a crab. 
can hear them crunch. Yeah, awesome. Well, hopefully maybe this sparks some more questions about foraging. I know Michelle mentioned that she had collected a lot of foraging data with moms and pups. Is there any other questions, Robin? Yeah, uh, so we've got another question from uh, Christine. Do the moms and their pups stay together with other moms and pups? Very good question. I'm gonna give this one to Michelle since she's our mother pup expert. So when the moms and when the pups are brand new or they're first born and they're very young, the mother usually likes to stay by herself with her pup. She spends a few days with it, getting to know it. And then after maybe a week or so, sometimes less, she'll move into a raft and there will be groups of otters with mothers and pups. Like in Elkhorn Slough, for example, there is a, a raft there or an area there where all the mothers and pups hang out together. So over time, they do like to raft up in groups together. And that's fun. Any more questions, Robin? Yeah, we've got um, another question from Kat D. Uh, having spent many years observing the otters and disturbances in Morro Bay, do the local rental places tell kayakers and stand-up paddleboard companies about the viewing guidelines disturbances prior to rental? This is a very good question. It's something that Sea Otter Savvy works very hard at. And so Jenna, I'm gonna pass that to you. One of Sea Otter Savvy's most important programs is our partnership with the local marine recreation businesses. So we really can't do this without working directly with them. Um, up here, talking to individual people one at a time, while it's a really great mechanism for us to transmit information, it's a lot more effective if we can train the staff and owners of these businesses that are gonna talk to many, many, many hundreds of people as they're renting. So um, we do work with the majority of the marine recreation businesses, kayak rental shops, eco-tour companies along the central coast, especially in places where um, there are these disturbance hotspots that we've been talking about. Uh, they do uh, have all kinds of information that they can use to share with their, to educate their customers before they go on the water. Sometimes they offer guided tours, which are really great. It's actually the way that I highly recommend enjoying uh, these sensitive areas like the Elkhorn Slough and, and um, the Back Bay of, of Morro Bay. Um, and they will provide an orientation. They have graphics that they can use to help people understand the guidelines. Um, and I will say uh, there are a few standouts. So if you go to our website uh, and look for the Get Certified tab, you can actually see some of our community active wildlife stewards. These are businesses along the Central Coast that have demonstrated an extraordinary level of stewardship. And we recognize and have certified them for the efforts that they go above and beyond to try to educate their customers and send good stewards out on the water. So you can see a gallery of those certified members. Um, and many of them will display a specific logo that you can keep an eye out for. But we definitely, uh, one of the foremost programs uh, of our Sea Otter Savvy program to work directly with the, the, the local businesses and other members of the community. Absolutely. And as Jenna said, that people who are interested, if you are a business owner and you are coastal, you can go to seaottersavvy.org and you can learn more about that certification process. Um, and there's definitely materials for even just people wanting to recreate outside. We have all of that online. Um, all right, next question, Robin. Yeah, we've got another question from Sharon. Do the sea otters have any type of interaction with seals? Ah, good question. I wonder, does, uh, does Jenna, do you want to answer? I was going to put it to Mike or Joe, one of our... <laughs> That's a Mike question. All right, Mike. <laughs> All right. Uh, sea otters will interact with pinnipeds. Uh, we've had a number of documented cases where Otters will haul out in harbor seal uh, haul out sites. We'll have male otters interacting with harbor seals, uh, attempting to, to mate. Um, we 
have other documented cases where you see kind of a, uh, a connection, but uh, in general, you, it's uh, a rare event to see. Am I on the camera? Right you are, oh. yep. <laughs> and we do have some harbor seals and sea lions at most uh, harbors and bays too. So they do coexist together, but the actual interaction is. Not yeah, generally they separate, but there are a few. Sea otter haul out sites tend to be uh, close to harbor seal haul out sites. Uh, but there's, there's research that has uh, linked male mating attempts on harbor seals is actually killing harbor seal pups. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think, Robin, we have time for one more question and then we're going to wrap it up. And if there are extra questions, we will, of course, go back and then they will all get answered in the comment section after. Yeah, so we've got our last question from Tracy Braun. With the loss in kelp beds due to urchins and other environmental factors, how much of this is due to decline in otters? Ah, very good ecological question. I wonder, Joe, do you want to tackle this question? Sure, I can I can take that one. Um, so the as you mentioned, there has been kind of uh, serious mm -hmm. loss in kelp canopy in areas of California. Um, and that's, you know, I think was also in the question attributed largely to um, an explosion in sea urchins, though um, really warm water temperatures probably has had a lot to do with that too over the past few years with um, El Ninos mm -hmm. and, and changing environmental conditions those years. Um, warm water stresses kelp out a lot. And if the kelp is stressed, it's easily ripped out by winter storms and wave action and things like that. And once it gets ripped out, it creates a lot of food for sea urchins and then the sea urchins explode. And so it's kind of this whole uh, big process. Um, in terms of the sea otter's role there, uh, the sea otter plays a huge role in that system as a keystone species. Um, but, the, it's a really complex system and it's sometimes hard to tease out just how much a role they play with certain things. Certainly sea otters are major, or sea otters are major sea urchin predators. So by preying on sea urchins, they can help um, preserve uh, the overgrazing or prevent the overgrazing of, of the kelp beds like that. And I think it's kind of an interesting example. If you drive up to uh, Mendocino or Humboldt or any, anywhere like that where there's no otters today. There's also no kelp up there because it's just urchin barrens everywhere. And places like Monterey, even though it may not have as much kelp as it had five years ago, um, there's still some kelp beds in Monterey and there's still a lot of otters in Monterey. So um, there definitely seems to be a connection there. Thanks, Joe. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Again, viewers, if you're watching now, if you're watching later on, feel free to leave comments and questions down below. We'll make sure to get those answered for you. I want to thank everyone so much for your time um, and your expertise. This has been absolutely phenomenal um, just to go hundreds of miles along the central California coast and see what the Seattle range um, actually is. And I want to thank Seattle Savvy so much for hosting Seattle Awareness Week. Um, and putting on such phenomenal events the entire week. So do make sure to check out other events throughout the week. Um, and again, if you have questions or comments, leave those below. We're getting a lot of uh, comments right now saying great event. Thank you. Thanks, Jenna. Um, lots of love coming from, uh, from Facebook. So again, I want to thank you all and I'm hoping you all have a beautiful day. Um, Kat D says, thank you all. This was great. So everyone's loving it. You guys are awesome and have a wonderful day. Bye everyone.